Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on 21 cable stations from Vermont to New York City and 24-7 on the internet at thestruggle.org. For years I've been reading about an extraordinary woman, Hetty Epstein. As a small child, she was sent to England out of Germany to escape the Holocaust that later murdered her parents. In her senior years, she took up the cause of Palestinian rights, and in her mid-80s, she made trips to Palestine and has attempted to get into the Gaza Strip. She spoke recently in Providence, Rhode Island, and will be showing parts of her talk on the next few programs. We couldn't give her the entire show today because we had to show at least part of the rousing speech by John Nichols at the Left Forum talking about his home state, Wisconsin, and the great workers' struggles there. We begin at Brown University in Providence. I was born in Germany, and when Hitler came to power in 1933, I was eight years old. And I remember hearing my parents and other adults talking about Hitler, saying at first they hoped he wouldn't come to power, and then after he did come to power, saying they hoped he wouldn't remain in power very long. But I didn't think that really had anything to do with me. I just thought it was a lot of nonsense that adults talk about. Uh, but I very quickly found out that really it did indeed did have something to do with me. And I also realized that my parents were trying to leave Germany because of what Hitler represented to them. And they were willing to go anywhere in the world just to get out. I remember hearing my father saying, nur raus, meaning just to get out. But there was one place they were not willing to go to, and that was Palestine. And why was that? Because my parents were anti-Zionists. And I didn't, as a young child, fully understand what a Zionist is or an anti-Zionist. But if my parents were Zionists, then I was one too. And I remember going to my grandmother and to my aunt and saying, I'm an anti-Zionist. And they said, shh, don't say, don't say anything. And they said, but I am. <laughs> And uh, there was a Zionist youth group uh, in the village, and all the Jewish children belonged to it. I was the only Jewish child who did not belong to it because my parents did not allow it. And my, the efforts to leave Germany on the part of my parents became increasingly more desperate as time went on. And I... Some of, I just want to share with you some of the things that I experienced while I was still in Germany. For instance, and I attended the grade school in the village for four years, and then my parents decided that I should go to school in a neighboring community where the educational level was somewhat higher. And I went with my father to be enrolled, and the principal said, I'm sorry, but Haiti cannot come to school here because you're Jewish. And my father didn't say a word, and I expected him to say something to protest, or, but he didn't. And all he did was point to a pin that he wore always very proudly in the lapel of his jacket. And the principal said, oh, excuse me, I did not know that you are a wounded veteran of World War I. In that case, Hetty can come to school here. And apparently there was a quota for children such as I uh, who were allowed to attend that school. I had a math teacher in that school who was an SS man. The SS were the Nazi stormtroopers, the Nazi elite. And he came to class almost every day wearing his black SS uniform, knee-high black boots, and in his right boot, he usually carried a revolver. And when he asked me questions, he sometimes would have his hand on the revolver or a couple times actually pointed it at me. And no matter what my answers were to his questions, whether they were right or wrong, he'd ridicule me 
in front of my classmates and say, that's a Jewish answer. And we all know Jewish answers are no good. A real change in my life, which my parents had tried to protect me as much as they could from what was happening, happened on November 10th, 1938. That was the period that's been referred to as Crystal Night or the Night of the Broken Glass. And it was the first major act of persecution against Jews in Germany and Austria. Austria had already been annexed to Germany at that time. I was unceremoniously kicked out of school that day by the principal who came into the classroom, pointed his finger at me and said, get out, you dirty Jew. When I came home, our home was vandalized. My mother, who should have been there, was not there. I found her in my, at my aunt's house and found out that about 10 minutes after I left for school that morning, my father had been arrested. Uh, we did not know for two weeks where he was or whether he was even still alive. He was in the concentration camp Dachau, which was the first camp, concentration camp that the Nazis constructed in 1933. By 38, there were several others in Germany. He came home two, f after four weeks, but no longer the father that I knew. He was an old, broken, very sick man. After he was relatively well again, the efforts to leave Germany were resumed. But now the focus had changed. It was decided if one of us can leave, that person will leave, and hopefully the others can follow soon thereafter. And I was fortunate. I was able to leave on May 18, 1939, on a children's transport, or a kindertransport, as it was called. And we all went to England. England took in almost 10,000 mostly Jewish children from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia in the nine months preceding World War II, and would have taken more, except the war broke out. And when I said goodbye to my parents as the, when they took me to the train in Frankfurt, Germany, they said, and we will see, they gave me you know, the last uh, instructions you know, to be good, to be honest, and all those things that parents tell their children. And then the last sentence was, as it had been even prior to that, as they prepared me to go, and we will see each other again soon. And I believed that. Whether my parents did, I don't know. My parents and all, all the other Jews from that section of Germany that I come from, uh, southwest Germany, were deported to a camp which was located in what was then Vichy, France. Uh, and they were deported on October 22nd, 1940. In the summer of 1942, those of my family who survived those camps in Vichy, France, were deported to Auschwitz, and none have ever been heard from again. I came to this country in May 1948, which was about the same time that Israel became a state. And I had some really mixed feelings. On one hand, I was very glad that there was a place for Holocaust survivors to go to because maybe they chose not to or could not go back to the places where they came from. But on the other hand, remembering my parents' ardent anti-Zionism, I was afraid that somewhere down the road, no good would come of this. What that might be, I couldn't possibly imagine. But I was new in the United States, new things to learn, new impressions, and so Israel and Palestine were on the back burner of my interest and remained there for a very long time. In 1982, I got what you might call a wake-up call. I heard about the massacres in the two refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila, located in Lebanon. And I needed to find out, what was that all about? Who was responsible for this? Who was adversely affected by it? 
and what happened between 1948 and 1982 when I paid little or no attention to that part of the world. And as I learned more and understood more, I became increasingly more disturbed about the policies and practices of the Israeli government and the Israeli military as, they, as it related to the Palestinian people and the Palestinian land. And as I learned more and understood more, I began to speak out and speak out publicly against those policies and practices. And then in September of 2003, I participated in a vigil in St. Louis, where I live, that we have been conducting ever since a few days after 9-11. And it was first hoping to stop the war in Iraq from happening, and since then, trying to prevent it from continuing. We've added Afghanistan and Pakistan since then. Um, and we've not succeeded in stopping it. But I was standing at this vigil, and I participate there every Sunday evening at 7 o'clock when I'm in town. And a friend of mine, Diane, was standing next to me and asked me, do you ever think about going to Palestine? And I was absolutely shocked by my response, which was, yes, I'm going. Oh, wait a minute. What did I just say? I've not made any plans to go. But apparently, subconsciously, I had been thinking about and preparing myself to go. And by December of 2003, Diane, my friend Diane, two other women from St. Louis, and I were in Palestine, were in the West Bank for the first time, all of us for the very first time. Uh, we aligned ourselves with the International Solidarity Movement, uh, or ISM. Uh, the plan was that uh, a friend of ours who uh, had already been in the West Bank since October of 2003 was to meet us at the airport and then take us to where he had made arrangements for us to spend the first night. And we looked for him at the airport, and we called him, and could only leave a message on his cell phone. He was nowhere. And so we couldn't understand why, but to decide the message we left for him, Mark, we're going on to the place where you made arrangements for us to stay tonight. Uh, we're sorry we missed you at the airport. Hope to see you soon. And then we went out, and we get, went into a uh, sort of a taxi or service that uh, takes several people and when it's full it leaves and while we're sitting in there waiting for more people to come on board our phone rang ah oh, must be mark but no it wasn't mark the person at the other end identified himself by name and by his military rank and said we have mark we have detained him uh, we're questioning him uh, where where are you? Where are you going? Can we help you? And we just hung up. We did not respond. Because if we're going to tell him where we are, we, he's going to come and detain us also. So that was our welcome to Israel. Uh, we arrived at the Ben-Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. Mark and his the, the Palestinian taxi driver and his Palestinian friend who were traveling together to come to the airport were detained at a checkpoint and they found some very, very uh, incriminating material in Mark's backpack. He had a, pamph a UNICEF pamphlet in there and they really questioned what that was all about and what his involvement was with UNICEF. He was released <laughs> The three of them were released after about 18 hours, uh, but they had been blindfolded, handcuffed. Uh, they were abused, the Palestinians more so than Mark, because he was an American. We, t and we As I mentioned, we aligned ourselves with ISM, or the International Solidarity Movement. And if you do that, you have, and if you want to participate in their activities, 
you need to undergo their nonviolent resistance training. And it's, a, it's rigorous training for two or three days, and you hear the word nonviolent, nonviolent over and over again. And you have to make a commitment that you, no matter whom you encounter, no matter what situation you encounter, you will respond nonviolently. If you cannot make that commitment, you cannot participate in any of ISM's activities. And we underwent this training and we made that commitment. Um, we were, our first place that we were sent to was Jayus, which is northwest of Jerusalem. It's a very old community. Many of the homes in Jayus are built on old Roman ruins. That's how old that community is. That's how old the olive trees are, or many of the olive trees in Jayus, if they're still there. At that time, there were still quite a number of them there. Uh, we arrived around 4.30 in the afternoon after traveling all day long. It shouldn't have taken us that long to get there, but in order to get through and around the checkpoints, and there are many of them, it just takes a long time. And we contacted the uh, ISM person there who was working in that community on a long-term basis. And we told him, we are tired, we're hungry, we need a place to stay, can you help us find a place? And he immediately got on the phone, made a phone call, and as soon as he got off, he said, I just called this family, it's a Palestinian family, it's a lovely family, it's an extended family, and they are waiting for you, I'm going to take you over there. And, you know, in the United States, I think, if we call, if we get a call at 4.30 in the afternoon, uh, we have three people here who need a place to stay and need to be fed. Uh, could you take care of that? The answer will probably be, well, I have a meeting tonight and tomorrow morning I have a doctor's appointment and call me another time. That just doesn't happen in Palestine. This was the first time that we experienced what Palestinian hospitality is like, which is unlike any that I've ever experienced anywhere in the world. And this was only the very first time when I, as you heard, I've been to the West Bank five times since 2003. And each time I try to stay with Palestinian families in different communities wherever I am and with different families. And each time I experience this wonderful Palestinian hospitality. Our very first um, demonstration we participated in was on the 26th of December, 2003, in the village of Masha, which is also northwest of uh, Jerusalem. Um, at the time, there was no wall up around the community. It's a farming community. But there was a fence, and there was a gate in the fence, and that gate had not been opened for two weeks. And the, peop the farmers in this community had not been able to go to their fields and do whatever needed to be done. And so this demonstration was organized. And the participants in this, or in this demonstration were, of course, Palestinians, uh, some Israelis, peace-loving Israelis, and internationals from all over the world. And we met in the community center, uh, and we were instructed what uh, would happen, or what we can expect to happen, uh, and that we would try to march to the gate, and that we would try and open the gate, or some of us would try to open the gate. And if we succeed in opening it, we will not go through it. We would just symbolically open the gate. And... Um, so, some of us were told to be blockers. And a blocker is, they explained, uh, is that sometimes the Israelis are not only that we're facing them, but they come around the back. And so the blockers were supposed to be in the back to try and prevent the Israelis from interfering with the demonstration. And I was supposed, to, I volunteered to be a blocker. 
um, when we got close to the uh, gate, I forgot all about what I was supposed to do. I was so anxious to open that gate, I marched straight towards that gate. And as I was getting close to the gate, or not only as I, but the others, and by the, by the way, the Israelis were in the front wearing signs on their shirts saying in Hebrew, we are Israelis, we are Jewish. Um, and as we got closer, I could hear gunshots. And with my American mindset, which doesn't work there, you need to leave that at home if you go over there. I thought they're shooting in the air warning us to go away. But no, they were shooting directly at us, live ammunition. And one of the very first persons who was critically injured was a young Israeli by the name of Gil Naamati. Gil Naamati had just been released from the Israeli military two weeks earlier after serving his three years of mandatory service. And perhaps because of what he had seen, or maybe even what he might have done, he felt it incumbent upon himself to um, protest against Israeli soldiers, of whom he had just been one just <coughs> until two weeks earlier. His aorta was severed. I have never seen anyone bleed so profusely. It's like you turn your faucet on full, uh, full term. He survived. I understand he is physically disabled, he is emotionally disabled because of what happened at that time. What has the government accomplished with its wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan? Nothing. When Middle East people fight for freedom, our government is on the wrong side. Can we even afford the wars with our tens of millions without jobs, the growing menace of climate change, and now nuclear calamity? U.S. troops should be brought home right now. Stop the war. Stop the mistreatment of American Muslims. Stop sending billions of dollars to Israel. Stop the FBI raids on activists. Bring the war dollars home. The people of the Middle East have shown that mass protests can win. 500 endorsing groups and individuals call for you to be in the streets on April 9th in New York. Assemble by noon, 14th Street and Broadway. For the details, go to unacpeace.org. John Nichols writes about politics for the Nation magazine, and he co-authored a recent book, The Death and Life of American Journalism. But let us also allow ourselves a moment of joy because I come from the state of Wisconsin. As optimistic, as hopeful as I have been, as so many times as I've worked with so many people, so many beautiful people in this room on so many struggles, I, I, I never allowed myself, I never, never allowed myself to imagine the experience I had a week ago today, when I stood on the steps of the state capital of Wisconsin, a place where I was brought as a child by my grandmother, the daughter of a Wisconsin progressive who did not believe in a Democratic or Republican party, who joined with the socialists and the progressives of our state to speak truth to power and to say that corporations must not control our democratic life. When I went to that capital as a child, that very capital, I stood on those same steps last Saturday, and I looked out at a crowd of 150,000 people standing down the streets, down the alleys, down the avenues, filling every bit of space Young girls who had climbed 60, 70 feet into the trees, standing along the branches. And all of these people chanting, chanting, this is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. The people outside their house demanding, demanding that power listen to them. 
What's happened in Wisconsin in the last few weeks is an amazing thing. It is a struggle for democracy, but it is also a struggle for a great slice of pizza. <laughs> and if there is anyone in this room who has not heard the story of Ian's Pizza in Madison, let me tell it to you now. If you go on Google, using all that new technology, and you Google capital of Wisconsin and pizza, you get Ian's. It's a pizzeria a block from the capital. And when it was learned that thousands of Wisconsinites had occupied the capital of Wisconsin, sleeping there through the night, day after day, to protest an assault on worker rights, someone, somewhere out there in the world, Googled capital and pizza. <laughs> and they got Ian's and they sent an order of pizza to the protesters. And somebody else heard about it, and they did the same thing. And within a week, people from all 50 states and more than 60 nations around the world had called pizzas in to the capital. that the union that represents the workers at the Suez Canal in Egypt had called in a multiple order of pizzas, we knew that we had come full circle in our story. And when the weather observers in Antarctica, who are members of a union I didn't even know existed, called in their orders of pizza, we were able to say that every continent on the planet stood in solidarity with the people of Wisconsin. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.